Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So later in the episode, I'm going to take a mailbag question about food. And one of the major kind of points I want to make about food is that you want clean food with ingredients you can pronounce. That's why public goods is so cool. It's not just food. It's all sorts of, you know, basics like uh, dish soap and uh, uh, toilet paper. And they have like, uh, you know, cat food and all that stuff. Um, but really what it is, is everything that you get there is made with stuff that you can trust to be kind of clean and simple. I mentioned on Twitter that I was in Europe and I ate and ate and ate, but I didn't like get, you know, put on a bunch of fat or anything. And I think that's because we just have like a lot of kind of gross processed stuff in a lot of our grocery store food here in the States. Public goods fixes that. Um, it's one of the best places to get basics of all different kinds, and they look great in your kitchen. That's the other thing. They have this very clean aesthetic, so you don't end up with like weird blue soaps all over your kitchen counter and so on and so forth. Um, if you have a cat, he will love their freeze-dried duck nibs, which I love to say. And they have an awesome deal for my listeners only. You can get 15 bucks off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. That's to say just 15 bucks of free stuff when you go to publicgoods.com slash heretics, publicgoods.com slash heretics to try 15 bucks worth of free stuff from public goods. All right. That's the famous song by the Beatles, of course. No, 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 I'm just kidding. That is the uh, words of our Lord and Savior. That's the uh, Matthew 6 Sermon on the Mount. And I wanted to start with a good chunk of it because last week um, I really enjoyed, I hope you did too, talking through the nature of forgiveness um, in the gospel and indeed through Traherne's really profound, I think, extension of the joy of God and therefore of us, um, even into the depths of sorrow. And I hope that that kind of middle of it, of, of our series on this wonderful author, will excuse him in your sight from uh, from the accusation that he's just kind of airy-fairy or namby-pamby, and he's just talking about, like, everything is great and fine, and look at the sun shining and the birds and the feathers. Um, that's not what he's about at all, and I, I think he really defends himself from that accusation. Um, all of that having been said, right, um, one of the things that gets me about Traherne is that he opens up the scriptures in this really fascinating way. And so you end up like commenting on one line. I start to feel like one of these ancient scribes who's like, you know, uh, yes, and this word here. And then the, before you know it, you're like five chapters in and like you've completely lost sight of the text. Um, so because there's so much richness in those two verses that we read last time, uh, we spent most of our time on on forgiveness uh, in those, those two different verses. And so I wanted uh, to begin now with a good uh, sort of stretch of the uh, section after the Lord's Prayer. Um, and I think that now that we've been through a two week long so far journey with Traherne, um, we can say a lot more about these verses than we perhaps could at the beginning. Um, let's start with verse 16, right? When you fast, hotan de neste oete, me geneste, hos hoi hypocriti, do not be like the hypocrites. And I've said this before, but it bears repeating, right? A hypocrite is an actor. Um, it is somebody who performs on stage. And it's worth asking ourselves, why is Christ's main metaphor for the, uh, you know, for, for moral vacuity, for uh, self-regard and uh, dishonesty and a certain form of pride, right? Um, why is his main metaphor for this the actor? Uh, is it just because he wanted us to hate on Michael Knowles? Um, and it might be, you know, we never know. Maybe maybe God is just telling us we need to give Knowles, uh, you know, a harder time. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, that's not why, right? It's, the, it's not because he had some particular vendetta against actors themselves right, um, on the stage, um, it's because this notion, right, of having the outward form be the thing you attend to, of doing something to be seen before men, right, um, 
This, this is precisely the thing that prevents us from engaging in the kind of mind flip that Traherne wants us to do, and I think uh, Christ wants us to do in this sermon, this metanoia, right? When I said mind flip, that's a kind of, uh, you know, modern slangy translation of metanoia, which we often think of as repentance, but it just means thinking again, right? It means changing of the mind. Um, and, and what I've been saying throughout this series is that Traherne is talking to us about a 180 shift. Uh, it's just give all for all. There's one way of looking at the world and there's another way and they're incompatible. And if you give up on all the sort of pleasures and d desires and needs of the one way, you will get uh, the entirety of joy, which is contained in, in the other way. And so, you know, to fast like a hypocrite, to fast like one who acts before men, right? Um, this is precisely what, what is meant. And it turns your gaze uh, inward toward yourself so that you can think about how you look and the way you're trying to look is sad. Um, and that is the link, I think, between what we've been saying last week, um, which is that the height of joy shows itself, the height of love shows itself in times of sorrow, in, in times when forgiveness is needed, right? Um, now we can understand why it would be that you would want to act happy when you're fasting, right? Anoint thine head and wash thy face. Su de nesteoon, when you are fasting. Alepsai su tain kefalain, kai prosopon su nipsai, right? Wash your face. Um, why would you want to act happy when you're fasting, right? Isn't fasting kind of part of the, you know, uh, uh, self abnegation, self, uh, you know, the, isn't it, isn't it part of the abjection of, of worship before God? Um, and, and Traherne might help us to say, no, it's not just acting happy, right? Because that's just being another kind of hypocrite, another kind of actor, right? It's not just pretending like you're happy. It's actually being happy. It's, it's rejoicing, uh, let's say better word than being happy, right? Let's rejoicing to take upon yourself, um, this kind of, uh, difficulty or struggling or hardship um, so that your devotion and your love can shine forth uh, the more truly, right? This is, it's not actually about pretending to be happy when you're doing something unpleasant. It's about learning to take your joy with you into times of sorrow. That's why this verse goes the way it goes. Don't be like the hypocrite uh, showing how sorrowful you are, but rather anoint thy head and wash thy face that thou appear not unto men to fast. Don't do fasting in the way that the world thinks about fasting, but unto thy father. This is the godly kind of fasting, who, which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Hope le pon, uh, ento kufayo. We've had this phrase again and again, le pon, right? Who the, who the kind of vision um, of the unseen, right? The thing that is unseen is what stands most entirely before God's sight. Um, and that kind of fasting, uh, which is understood as a context for, uh, for deeper joy, higher up and deeper in, right? Deeper joy, deeper love. Um, that kind of fasting is the fasting that God sees um, in secret that men cannot see. So the artist formerly known as True Bill has had a glow up and is now called Rocket money. It's the same uh, great service where they can help you to cancel all your subscriptions, right? You spend a ton probably on subscriptions that you don't use every month. Um, they renew these trials without your consent. You sign up for a free trial and then you go back and it's just like you're locked in for a year or something. That is why you have to check out Rocket Money. They're doing the best job out there at helping you to cancel those subscriptions. And they have really upgraded uh, to all sorts of other services as well. They are now backed by Rocket Companies and they have changed their name, as I mentioned. And part of that is because they've been growing and growing. They've become a full-on personal finance empowerment tool. They help over 3.4 million people with budgeting, lowering bills, canceling subscriptions, all the stuff you need to get your finances in order. That stuff is important. I know because it's not something that I just automatically think about a lot. It's not my in my nature to really like, you know, dig deep into the, analyzing my finances. So I love to have Rocket Money to help me out with that. You can start canceling your unused subscriptions and save money at rocketmoney.com slash heretics. That's rocketmoney.com slash heretics. Or you can download the app from the Apple App Store or Google Play. And so now having kind of bridged the gap from forgiveness and the cross and Ephesus into fasting and not looking sad about it, right? Um, we get this line, which seems like kind of a non sequitur, right? We've been focusing a lot in this series on the sort of unexpected nature of a lot of this text and the weirdness of some of the stuff he's saying. Um, and I hope that one thing Traherne has helped us to do, he's certainly helped me to do this, um, is to unpack why these things come across so weirdly, why it is that they're, they're giving us a whole new way of looking at the world, a transformative way, um, which is in some sense salvation, or it's the part of salvation that we taste on earth. When, when Christ says the kingdom of heaven is here among you, right? I think this is what he's talking about. Um, and the way Traherne puts it is that love does not delay, right? The, the kind of love that is 
is true love um, that really expresses itself in the world um, is impatient and doesn't want to wait to enjoy. Right. Um, and so the kinds of Christians who say, well, I'll, you know, I'll uh, sort of get to uh, joy later. Right. For now, I'm just worried about getting and spending or whatever, um, you know, sort of tell on themselves, right? The real thing that you're about is trying to find your joy now. You want to be impatient about it. So that's what I'm going to talk about next, right? Um, but so here's this sort of strange next thing that Jesus says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Me theisau rizdiste, humin theisau rus, uh, epites gase, right? The thesaurus, uh, this is where we get our word thesaurus, right? But it's also, you know, treasures, right? Your treasury. Um, don't Put your treasures in heaven for where your treasure is there, your heart should be. Well, there's another verse, so I'll say that. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? They saw rus and urano, where neither moth nor roth, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so now we kind of get, I think, to the core, having passed through the valley of death, right? Having sort of understood why the cross is so important to this vision, we really are getting now to the core of what Traherne uh, has to say to us about what Jesus has to say to us in this text, right? Um, which is that the, uh, why does this whole exhortation come right after the fasting, right? Fasting and enjoying fasting. It's because understanding the world from this opposite perspective, this full repentance, right? Um, which is not just like, oh, I did a bad thing. Well, that's part of it, right? Um, but it's a whole mind shift, right? Um, the same shift of mind that enables you to uh, fast in delight, or at least in joy, right? Uh, that enables you to wash your face and smile when you fast and seek God's approval and not men's, right? That's the shift of mind that is described in lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. It's a shift of mind. It's a metanoia. And so in some ways, these verses 19 through 21 are a summation. They're an explanation of what's been sort of said in the examples of fasting and giving alms and all the stuff that you're supposed to do in secret, right? Um, these don't, this is not a non sequitur. It's not something that he just says, you know, because this is the next topic he has. This is the kind of, um, you know, wrap up of this mind shift of this metanoia that he's talking about. And so I want to read read for you a passage in which Traherne talks exactly about this, this mind shift. Um, and then I want to explore more deeply kind of the sources of it, because uh, we, I, I, I mentioned this passage earlier on, um, but I'd like to spend a little more time with it because it's, I think, very important to what we're talking about. This is century number one, meditation number seven. To contemn the world and to enjoy the world are things contrary to each other. How then can we contemn the world, which we are born to enjoy? Truly, there are two worlds. One was made by God, the other by men. That made by God was great and beautiful. Before the fall, it was Adam's joy and the temple of his glory. That made by men is a babel of confusions, invented riches, pomps and vanities, brought in by sin. Give all, saith Thomas Akempis, for all. Leave the one that you may enjoy the other. This is metanoia, right? This is the change of mind that opens up the delights of God's world for you, that turns the whole world into a gift of God. And crucially, we talked about this before, turns your brother into a gift of God. And this is something that can be a little controversial if you think about it carefully enough, right? Um, the idea that the whole world, like the plants and the trees, was made by God for you to enjoy, right? Um, enjoying in the way that we've been talking about now for a while, of, of seeing and delighting in it as itself, not wanting to possess or to control, right? Um, okay, fair enough, right? I can imagine like a tree can can be that way. Um, I can even imagine that a dog might be that way, right? It's got its own mind, it's got its own will, but it, in some sense, kind of finds its greatest fruition in, it, you know, in, in domestication and training, right? I can, I could construct an argument about that. But my brother, right, the fellow man, is a person all unto himself, right? So how can he be part of the world that God gives to me? Well, I think that this repentance, this metanoia, um, that is all about looking outward, right? It's all about forgetting uh, how you look to others and, and thinking about uh, what's right in front of you and delighting in the sight of it because you delight in God who has created it, right? Um, that looking outward changes the way that we might think about our brother being a gift for, of God to us, right? Um, you know, some people are very annoying, <laughs> right? Some people uh, we find quite boring. And 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 when you talk to those people, right, that this shift of mind can actually transform the whole way you think about all your human interactions. It's like one neat trick, you know, um, this one weird tip 
will change the way you experience other people even, right? If you think of them as part of the world that God has given to you, but the part of the world that they are, right, is an entirely independent and other rational animal, right? Um, and, and then if you think about it, it's like they don't even have to be very pleasant or nice or enjoyable for that to be an amazing and fascinating thing, right? An entirely independent being that is given to you not to control, not to possess, not to dominate, but simply to delight in, in the same way that you delight in its place in the sun, right? The sun has a certain nature and you delight in it in that way. And your brother has another nature, a much higher nature of being a rational animal who sees the world and, and judges it, right? And, and evaluates it in, in terms of its, you know, goods and evils. Um, and and he's, he does that in a way that is entirely distinct from you. And if you can learn to delight in that without wanting to possess it, right? To have it without possessing it, which is Traherne's whole point, right? Um, then you can suddenly understand that not only has God given you your brother, but in your brother, he's given you the whole world again, right? It wasn't enough to give you the sun and the clouds and the trees and, you know, video games and life and light and books and all that stuff, right? Uh, all these things that we are able to enjoy. He also gave it to you refracted through the sight of somebody else who sees them differently, who maybe likes different books, right? Who, who uh, has different opinions about those books. And so <laughs> this kind of love, right, which I think Paul talks about in Romans 12, where he talks about the different parts of the body, right? Um, and he talks about the renewal of the mind that enables us to enjoy one another as parts of the body. Um, this is an amazing kind of thing when you think about it, because it actually means that in order to love someone, you don't have to like them very much. Um, and that's even before you get into all the stuff we were talking about last week with forgiveness. What if they do you wrong? Right. That's true, too. Um, but you can actually delight in somebody, even if you find them kind of weird or silly or whatever, right? Um, you can, you can love your, your neighbor as this kind of whole new thing. And, and, and this is going to be a weird comparison, but sometimes you look in the ocean or something, you know, you see a picture of something that was dredged up in the ocean and you think, holy crow, like what was, what was God doing there? Do you know what I mean? Like if, if you believe that God created everything and then you're like, wow, just this, you know, antelope, uh, or Job in, in the book of Job, God kind of says this to, um, to Job about a lot of different things, like the ostrich, right? Like, can you understand what the ostrich is like? And so when you see the ostrich, it's like, whoa, like, I guess I know more now about God and his delights. Um, and because I delight in God and because I have aligned my will to his, right, because I want what is good for him, which is, you know, his will, because his will is good. Um, then I know that, wow, all of creation is like this. And even this person that's sort of like difficult to deal with and maybe like a little bit strange and grating. doesn't mean you have to like spend every hour of your day with them. It does mean you can have a lot more sort of appreciation and, and fondness, um, even for people that are not going to be your best friend, um, in part because they are giving you the whole world as seen through another set of eyes. And Lewis says uh, when he talks about friendship that this is why the angels in Isaiah's vision call out holy, holy, holy to each other, right? Each one has a unique piece of the beatific vision, um, which he then gives to his fellows, right? And in that, we kind of receive the world again and again. Um, the hymn says evermore from his store, new worlds rise up to adore. And I think it's very different uh, when it says that. It's very different from the kind of multiverse idea that there's all these different parallel universes, right? Um, this is the idea that new worlds are contained, a new world is contained in the birth of each new soul. Um, so, okay, that's the metanoia that I think this is all about, right? That this is how, you know, the, the flip, the mind flip works, um, that it gives you the whole world in that mind flip. In the minute you see God delighting in all things, um, you have mind flipped your way into all of the stuff we've been talking about, repentance of, uh, and, and Ephesus and forgiveness um, and delight in your brother, love for your brother, loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, I wanted, therefore, to chase up this really important citation that uh, Traherne gives us. Give all for all. Leave the one that you may enjoy the other. He says, give all, saith Thomas Akempis. Now, who is Thomas Akempis? Thomas Akempis is a uh, German-Dutch canon um, from the kind of medieval era. I guess he's born um, in the late 14th century, so late 1300s. Um, and he has this book, The Imitation of Christ. And that's where this comes from. Um, and I wanted to read to you the chapter in which this give all for all occurs, because it will sort of launch us into uh, sort of, I, I think this is probably the last thing for now that I want to talk about with Traherne um, as we kind of draw this to a, to a close. So this is Imitation of Christ, book three, chapter 37. Yeah, chapter 37. Um, and it's, it's sort of subtitled, Of Pure and Entire Resignation of Self for the Obtaining Liberty of Heart. And notice that the two parts of that, right, we often, I think, as uh, as American Christians, we're so 
embarrassed about how prosperous we are as a nation, um, that we want to insist upon the self abnegation and the objection, right? The pure entire resignation, the total depravity and all that's true, right? But note that Kempis gives us two parts, right? Of this, of pure and entire resignation of self for the obtaining liberty of heart. We're getting something out of this. Give all for all. Um, so here's the, in quotes, this is God, right? My son, lose thyself and thou shalt find me. Stand still without all choosing and all thought of self and thou shalt ever be a gainer. For more grace shall be added to thee as soon as thou resignest thyself and so long as thou dost not turn back to take thyself again. So give all for all, right? The all is you, right? You, all of your sort of, um, you know, attachments and desires and the things that you've been taught to want in the world, your ambitions, right? Um, wiping those clean and and turning outward toward the world that God has in fact given you, not the world that you wish it was, not the reality that you wish you could reshape, but toward the world that God has given you is in some sense abandoning yourself and getting the world, the real world, right? Here's what uh, the, the sort of speaker answers. Oh Lord, how often shall I resign myself? And in what things shall I lose myself? The Lord answers always, every hour in that which is little and that which is great. We talked about this last week with forgiveness too, right? Take up your cross is like not because every challenge is going to be like a crucifixion. Um, it's because the gesture of the cross is the gesture you do in everything, great and small. And that which is little and that which is great, I make no exception, but will that thou be found naked in all things. Otherwise, how canst thou be mine and I thine, unless thou be inwardly and outwardly free from every will of thine own? The sooner thou dost this, the better shall it be with thee, and the more fully and sincerely, the more thou shalt please me, and the more abundantly shalt thou be rewarded. This, by the way, this is true, right? I mean, it's easy to, I mean, it's fun, of course, to talk about it at a, at a theoretical level and to see how it all hangs together and to unlock some of the meaning of the text, all that part of the point of this show, right? Um, don't forget that this is a real thing, right? That's actually on offer. You can delight, right, in the in the world that God has made. Some resign themselves, but with certain reservations, for they do not fully trust in God. Therefore, they think that they have some provision to make for themselves. Some, again, at first offer everything, but afterwards, being pressed by temptation, they return to their own devices and thus make no progress in virtue. This is kind of reflective, I think, of the parable of the sower, right, who sows the seeds, um, and it kind of sinks down, sinks down roots, but then it gets snatched away, right, uh, make no progress in virtue. They will not attain to the true liberty of a pure heart, nor to the grace of my sweet companionship, unless they first entirely resign themselves and daily offer themselves up as a sacrifice. Remember, Romans, Paul, right? Um, you know, prepare thy body, prepare thyself as a living sacrifice and a logike sacrifice, a, a mind sacrifice, a sacrifice of your rational part. Without this, the union which bringeth forth fruit standeth not, nor will stand. Many a time I have said unto thee, and now say again, give thyself up, resign thyself, and thou shalt have great inward peace. Give all for all. Demand nothing, ask nothing in return, stand simply and with no hesitation in me, and thou shalt possess me, right? This is the reason that you're giving yourself up is to possess God, right? You shall have me, not in the way that you want to possess, not in the way that you control him or dictate what reality he's made or dictate his creation um, or tell him what to do, but in the way that you have a lover, right? The way that you have a friend, uh, give all for all and you shall have me. Thou shalt have liberty of heart and the darkness shall not overwhelm thee. For this strive thou, pray for it long after it, that thou mayest be delivered from all possession of thyself and nakedly follow Jesus who was made naked for thee, mayst die unto thyself and live eternally to me. Then shall all vain fancies disappear, all evil disturbings and superfluous cares. Then also shall immoderate fear depart from thee and inordinate love shall die. What an amazing passage. And it's uh, nice to reflect upon this as something that was on Traherne's mind as we turn now um, to this last thing that I want to talk about. And that is, uh, you know, this, how this metanoia remakes the entire world. If you run a small business and you are hiring, you need to check out Indeed. This is something that can be a huge time saver for you, especially, you know, in this job market. One of the things that I see a lot is people will put out a job advertisement. They won't really know quite where to look and they'll get all these candidates and these resumes that they have to then rifle through and like not very fruitfully because you're not necessarily getting the best candidates or it's going to take you forever to find them. 
If you are hiring, you need Indeed because you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. They are the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. And as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with instant match with resumes on Indeed that match your job description. This is such a lifesaver um, for a lot of people I know, including Soundfront, which makes this podcast, um, to find quality candidates whenever they are hiring. You can start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit and upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash heretics. That's only for my listeners. So you've got to use that link indeed.com slash heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, just like in the title, terms and conditions apply, need to hire, you need indeed. So let me read you one more pair of lines from the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 6. This is verse 22. The light of the body, holuchnos, which is really like a lamp. It's not just the fos, which is the kind of light in the total and abstract sense, but the luknos, the light of the body, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, which is haplus, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Holon tosoma su onestai. If therefore that light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. If thine eye be evil, thine whole, whole body shall be full of darkness. Think it for a second, right? In the context of having just read that Kempis, the Thomas the Kempis passage, um, why it is that the comparison here is not between good and evil, but single and evil, simple, haplus, right? Um, it's because the delight in one thing, in God alone, is what we're getting when we trade in the desires of the world, right? Um, if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be photainon, shall be full of light. Um, and so when, when the light is the luknos, right, um, which is, as like I said, the lamp, right, it's giving you folks, which is to say the light, right? It's, the, it's not the point of it. The point of it isn't the eye. The point is that the light is a kind of channel or a source um, for the folks. And the folks, right, the light um, is the way that the whole world looks. And light is the kind of thing, right, the that you don't look directly at, right? You don't look directly into the sun. You see and know the world by the influence of that light. Um, and so it's not that like your eye is projecting light out like the sun is projecting light out, although that is a thing that was kind of thought in, in antiquity. But Christ is using that idea here to get at something much more profound, um, which is that the way that you commit to looking at the world colors the whole world. If you do that, right, your whole being, your whole body um, shall be full of light, shall be photain on. But if not, how great is that darkness? Because everything, even good things, right, even things that you desire and then get uh, contribute to just the sort of uh, hamster wheel, the hamster wheel of the world, which sometimes promises good, and then dashes your hopes and, you know, just wraps you up in all of this sort of pride and self-dealing. Um, when you give all of that up and your eye becomes haplus, becomes single, then the whole world, right, and your whole body is full of light. That's why the eye is a light, right? Um, sometimes people read this and they think, oh, well, Jesus just had an old, you know, pre-scientific idea about how vision works. Um, and one of the marvels, one of the miracles of the incarnation is he may well have, right? I don't, I'm not one of those who believes that uh, Jesus was omniscient at every point of his incarnation, which is to say, I think one of the things he shucked off and gave up for us when he took on flesh, right, was his omniscience, which he has in, in eternal time, right, in outside of time, he has that omniscience with the Father, co-eternal with the Father. All of that's true as the second person of the Trinity. But I think that the incarnation brings lack upon him, right? Brings need and ignorance even, uh, or perhaps a better way of putting it that wouldn't have that connotation rather than ignorance is, you know, not non-knowledge, lack of knowledge brings it upon him. So it's perfectly plausible to me that Jesus believed in what's called the extramission theory of vision. Um, and intromission was kind of an innovation of the early medieval period and, and of the, you know, the, the sort of science that comes into, na the natural science that kind of becomes popular at that time. Um, so it took a long time for people to figure this out, but that's beside the point, right? The material, the matter of this idea about the eye um, is here standing in for, right? It's what, what Jesus is not giving you is a scientific explanation of how light works materially. What he's giving you is a, perfect image for how metanoia works, right? For how repentance works. If, you're, if your eye, right, is turned toward God, it is haplus, right? You give everything else up except for him. Then you get this 
light of the whole world. So this is what I want to turn to now with Traherne, because this is, again, crucial for Traherne's give all for all, right? Um, and it, it turns it turns us now toward this idea of wanting, right? When you, what do you want, right? What do you really want? Um, and you might answer that question all sorts of different ways. Right? I know I hear from you guys all the time about all the different things that you want. Um, you know, I want a job. I want more friends. I want sometimes good things, right? I want success. I want uh, money. I want sex. I want all this stuff. Um, and I, I don't think that actually giving those things up means never having any of them because, you know, you also want food and you're not going to give up food, right? Um, and yet, right? You do need to give them up in a certain sense. You need to give all for all. How is it that you need to do that? It's You need to understand that all of those wants, right, are kind of pale reflections and emanation of some much deeper, more core desire, right? And Aristotle could tell you this too, right, that your, your pleasures and your desires are pointing you toward the goodness of things, right? And so if that's true, then the goodness of things is leading you to the good, right? To even the highest good. Um, and so your wants are not wrong. They're just incomplete and uh, incompletely oriented until you give them all up, right? For the thing that they represent or stand in for, which is the desire of God, right? And that's metanoia. So here's, uh, um, let me, I've talked enough. Let me let Traherne talk. This is uh, century number one, uh, meditation 21. By the very right of your senses, you enjoy the world. The eye is the light, right? Uh, by the very right of your senses, you enjoy the world. Is not the beauty of the hemisphere present to your eye? Doth not the glory of the sun pay tribute to your sight? Is not the vision of the world an amiable thing? Do not the stars shed influences to perfect the air? Is not that a marvelous body to breathe in, to visit the lungs, repair the spirits, revive the senses, cool the blood, fill the empty spaces between the earth and heavens, and yet give liberty to all objects. That's key. I've been stressing this, uh, but here is Traherne saying it, right? And yet give liberty to all objects, to have without possessing, right? Um, prize these first, and you shall enjoy the residue, glory, dominion, power, wisdom, honor, angels, souls, kingdoms, ages. Be faithful in a little, and you shall be master over much. This is also from the gospel, right? If ye be not faithful in esteeming these, who shall put into your hands the true treasures? This is, you know, the treasure in heaven, right, is the, is the kind of, uh, all the stuff that we want out of heaven, right? We want eternal life, we want uh, all the goodies, we want pleasures forevermore. Um, Traherne is saying, yes, but the the core of it, right, which is the enjoyment of God, is there for you now. And if you're not delighting in that now, then what's who's to say that you will enjoy or take care of and uh, responsibly accept all the other stuff that emerges out of it? It's like saying, you know, if you, if if a child can't take care of a bike, right, why would you give it a car, right? <laughs> why would you give a kid a Maserati if they if they can't deal with their tricycle, right? Um, you have to learn in the small things, right? And the, which are, in, which contain the core of the big things, right? Um, and so this is why I've been saying throughout this series, right? Don't uh, love, you know, or don't skip right to the difficult question, right? Don't start asking about uh, the problem of pain and the need for repentance and forgiveness until you've mastered the easy stuff, right? The stuff that is easy to delight in. And then you can turn to the stuff we talked about last week. Um, be faithful in little and you shall be master over much. If you be not faithful in esteeming these, who shall put into your hands the true treasures? If you be negligent in prizing the stuff that's easy to prize, right? You will be negligent in prizing all. We, th we imagine, right, that we will love heaven, will enjoy heaven, um, even though we are kind of, recriminatory and nasty and, and small-minded on earth, right? Um, Traherne is saying, if you do this repentance, you can find in earth the core of the thing that you will value in heaven. That's why the kingdom of heaven is among you, is here, right? And if you can't delight in that here and now, um, then you might get heaven without even liking it, right? You might not even like heaven. Imagine, think about that for a second. You might, just as the kid with the tricycle is uh, ill-equipped, uh, is not responsible enough, to take care of the Ford F-150 or whatever other thing you're going to give to him. Um, if you are not delighted enough by the core of what's here on earth, um, then who's to say you'll be delighted by heaven, right? Maybe heaven is harder to delight in, or maybe it's bigger somehow, right? Um, maybe it's more rich and mature. I mean, again, a, a car is harder to drive than a tricycle, right? So, you know, if you can't drive the tricycle, uh, who's to say that you'll even like heaven when it's given to you? It's not that heaven won't be good. It's just that in order to love it, right, you have to be faithful in a little, little so that you can be master over much. Uh, 
For there is a disease in him who despiseth present mercies, which till it be cured can never be happy. He esteemeth nothing that he hath, but is ever gaping after more, which is when he hath, which when he hath, he despiseth in like manner. Insatiableness is good, but not ingratitude. This is one of my favorite lines in Traherne. We're going to now shift into talking about this. Insatiableness is good, but not ingratitude. Um, what can that mean? Well, I've been talking about uh, a little bit how we don't really want to believe the good news. I, I think we just want some struggle and suffering. And so we you know, insist upon, yes, the, the uh, deadness of the heart and sin and the depravity and all these things which are true, right? Um, but we kind of miss when we do that. We miss the fact that acknowledging all those things is the reason that we would want to pay attention to them at all is because it's the only route into delighting in the joy of the true glory of the Lord, right? All of which is very good, right? And so now Traherne talks to turns to talk about wanting, right? Wanting things. Uh, as I said before, right? What do you really want uh, underneath all of this stuff? And if you sit with your desires long enough, even if they're desires for like cake, right? If you sit with your desires for things that you know that you shouldn't have, like sex, abundant sex everywhere, right? Um, if you sit with them long enough and ask yourself, what do you, what do I really want? Um, sometimes it's like, just peace, right? Sometimes it's belonging. Sometimes it's, and, and therapists do this sometimes with their clients, right? What is, what's the underlying desire here? And the deeper you get into that question, the more you realize that the things you actually want, right, that you think these other goods will bring you um, are actually profounder than the sort of external things that you want, right? Why do you want lots of sex? Well, because I want, uh, you know, physical gratification and companionship. Well, why do you want companionship, right? If you ask this why question again, well, because I, I, I want to belong, right? Well, why do you want belonging? Um, well, because I, you know, I, I'm lonely, right? Um, and then you start to say, well, okay, so if you're lonely, maybe you shouldn't sleep with everything that moves <laughs> because that's a bad way to form long-standing relationships, right? So if you do this with yourself long enough, you realize that your deeper desires are actually pointing you sometimes away from altogether the immediate gratification and towards something that will be a deeper and more sustained gratification. Think about this. I've talked, I've used this example before, but you know, you get up at six in the morning and you want to work out and you have to get out of bed if you want to work out. Um, but you just feel so tired and you want comfort too. Right. And so you hit the snooze button and you never end up going to the gym. And so you get your comfort, your immediate comfort, right? You get the thing that is right there in front of you, the tasty, shiny object. Uh, but unless you deny yourself that immediate objective desire, you'll never learn that what actually happens when you go to the gym is you attain a richer form of comfort, right? You didn't even realize how uncomfortable you were in the body of somebody who never works out, right? So once you start to work out, then you realize, oh, I actually got the thing that I gave up when I left my bed, right? Um, and that's because you stopped for a second or even subconsciously and you said, well, what do I actually want when I want to stay in bed? What I really want is comfort. And comfort is actually going to be attained in a deeper and more sustainable way um, if I go to the gym. And uh, the deeper and the more you do this, the more you realize that all of your desires might actually have some substrate, um, some common substrate, which is the highest good of all. Here's where Traherne goes with this. It is of the nobility of man's soul that he is insatiable. For he hath a benefactor so prone to give that he delighteth in us for asking. Do not your inclinations tell you that the world is yours? Do you not covet all? Do you not long to have it, to enjoy it, to overcome it? To what end do men gather riches but to multiply more? Do they not like Pyrrhus, the king of Epire, add house to house and land to land that they may get it all? It is storied of that prince that having conceived a purpose to invade Italy, he sent for Caeneus, a philosopher and the king's friend to whom he communicated his design and desired his counsel. Caeneus asked him to what purpose he invaded Italy. He said, to conquer it. And what will you do when you have conquered it? Go into France, said the king, and conquer that. And what will you do when you have conquered France? conquer Germany. And what then, said the philosopher, conquer Spain. I perceive, said Caeneus, you mean to conquer all the world. What will you do when you have conquered all? Why then, said the king, we will return and enjoy ourselves at quiet in our own land. So you may now, said the philosopher, without all this ado. Yet could he not divert him till he was ruined by the Romans. Thus men get 100 pound a year that they may get another, and having two covet eight, and there is no end of all their labor because the desire of their soul is insatiable. Like Alexander the Great, they must have all, and when they got it all, be quiet. And may they not do all this before they begin. Nay, it would be well if they could be quiet, 
But after all, they shall be like the stars that are seated on high, but have no rest. What gain they more, but labor for their trouble. It was wittily feigned that the young, that, that young man sat down and cried for more worlds to conquer. So insatiable is man that millions will not please him. They are no more than so many tennis balls in comparison of the greatness and highness of his soul. Now, pay attention closely to what Treherne is doing here. This is an extraordinary passage, and it's extraordinary because usually the moralizing gesture here, the moralizing instinct is to condemn man for wanting so insatiably, right? Oh, the conqueror, right? This story has been told a million times, right? The conqueror just wanted to conquer and conquer, but he didn't have to conquer because he could have just stayed at home, right? Um, Traherne is not saying, he's not scolding people for having insatiable desires. He's actually saying it's not the desire, the insatiableness of the desire that's wrong. It's the object, right? It's it, You haven't noticed that this insatiable desire can't be satisfied by the things you're trying to fill it up with. You're trying to fill that gaping hole with food, trying to fill it with sex, you're trying to fill it with toys and money and all these goodies, and you never notice that it's still insatiable. And the next thing that Traherne says is not, right, you greedy SOB, <laughs> he says, it's the insatiability that's your highest good. And so you just need to turn it toward the highest good in the world. Here's what he says. The noble inclination whereby man thirsteth after, after riches and dominion is his highest virtue when rightly guided and carries him as in a triumphant chariot to his sovereign happiness. Men are made miserable only by abusing it. Taking a false way to satisfy it, they pursue the wind. Nay, labor in the very fire and after all reap but vanity. Whereas, as God's love, which is the fountain of all, did cost us nothing, so were all other things prepared by it to satisfy our inclinations in the best of manners uh, freely, without any cost of ours. Seeing, therefore, all satisfactions are near at hand, by going further, we do but leave them, and wearying ourselves in a long way roundabout, like a blind man, forsake them. They are immediately near to the very gates of our senses. It becometh the bounty of God to prepare them freely, to make them glorious and their enjoyment easy. For because his love is free, so are his treasures. He therefore that will despise them because he hath them is marvelously irrational. The way to possess them is to esteem them. And the true way of reigning over them is to break the world all into parts, to examine them asunder. And if we make them so excellent that better could not possibly be made, and so, if we find them so excellent that better could not possibly ma be made, and so made they could not be more ours to rejoice in all with pleasure answerable to the merit of their goodness. Uh, sometimes on Twitter, you'll get these gurus or fitness junkies that will say a tweet and then they'll put, read that again at the end of the tweet. I find this, I have to confess, extremely annoying, um, but but I'm, I'm going to say it now. Read that again. The way to possess them is to esteem them. That is a succinct statement of what I've been trying to convey to you from Traherne all along, right? This is that metanoia, that the eye is the light of the world, right? Why should the eye be the light of the world? Because the way to possess all things is to esteem them in the sight of God. Um, we're touching up here on a much older uh, and, and indeed more famous passage, and that's the opening of uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. So I'm just going to read that to you before we uh, turn to one last thing about uh, our insatiable desires. Uh, here's Augustine. Great are you, O Lord, and exceedingly worthy of praise. Your power is immense and your wisdom beyond reckoning. And so we men who are a due part of your creation long to praise you. We also carry our mortality about with us, carry the evidence of our sin and with it, the proof that you thwart the proud. You arouse us so that praising you may bring us joy because you have made us and drawn us to yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. That famous line, our heart is restless until it rests in you, is what Traherne is taking from the other angle, right? That restlessness he's saying is the great gift once you realize that it's there to make you see the goodness of God's creation. Once you see it, then you have it. Um, and, and this abundance, right, is the only thing that can satisfy the insatiableness of your want. So I love tea, but you know what I don't love? Woke companies that hate me. And that is why Gold River Trading Company is the place that I go for all my tea-related needs. And you should check them out if you have not 
already. Even if you weren't previously a big tea fan, big tea drinker, um, this is something that can really uh, add a lot to your day. Uh, their 1776 American Breakfast Blend is one of my favorites. They've got all sorts of different kinds, including a chamomile if you're not a big caffeine person. Um, and the best thing is that when you are buying from them, you know that they're not going to take your money and just funnel it toward the further unmaking of the American regime. These big corporations that take all this, the rake in all this cash, and then they poison you with uh, unhealthy sugary drinks. And then on top of that, just to boot, uh, they donate to all of these, you know, really disgusting, you know, hyper woke leftist causes. Um, none of that is anything that you need in your life. There are other good alternatives and Gold River Trading Company is one of them. When you go to goldrivercode.com, you can save 15% off all orders using the discount code heretics at checkout. So that's just for my listeners, 15% off at goldrivercode.com discount code heretics. The last thing I want to talk about before we leave turn for now is the correspondence in turn between the insatiableness of man's desire and the insatiableness of God's desire. And this is one of, to me, one of his most original and striking ideas, um, that the insatiableness of our desire is actually part of our image, the image of God in us. Because typically when we think about, oh, we, our heart is restless till we find our rest in you, we sort of think of that as a sign of our sin, right? That, that we are so impatient and, and, uh, grasping, uh, because we're separated from God and we just, you know, uh, all of our longings point toward him. And that's, that's true. All of that is true. Um, but to is talking about something a little bit different here, which is that that desire is good because it reflects something about God. And he, in this sense, he contrasts it with, um, the divine, beings of uh, Greek philosophy, um, because we've talked about this a little bit with uh, Epicurus, but in general, right, um, this is in the Republic as well, the gods of Greek philosophy are uh, impartial, right? They, they are above the, uh, the, the peep, they're above the need to, you know, intervene or desire or whatever. Um, so, you know, this is like uh, a kind of coldly rational way of, of thinking about it, which, you know, of course, if you uh, if you think about it, you can see why this seemed to make sense. The gods are perfect. They have no lack. And because they have no lack, uh, they must not, you know, actually want anything. And this is one of Socrates' big critiques in the Republic of Homer, right, who depicts the gods as having desires and intervening in human affairs to satisfy those desires and fighting with one another over them and so forth. Um, but here's what Traherne says about all of this. He says, Socrates was wont to say they are most happy and nearest the gods that needed nothing. By the way, these quotes that are in this passage uh, from Socrates come actually from Diogenes Laertius, um, whom we've visited before, lives of the most eminent philosophers, later work. They're not in Plato. Um, but they are reflective, I think, of, you know, a, a strain of thought in that's reflected also in Plato. And coming once up into the exchange at Athens, where they that traded asked him, what will you buy? What do you lack? After he had gravely walked up into the middle, spreading forth his hands and turning about, good gods, saith he, who would have thought there were so many things in the world which I do not want, and so left the place under the reproach of nature. He was wont to say that happiness consisted not in having many, but in needing the fewest things, for the gods needed nothing at all, and they were most like them that least needed. We needed heaven and earth, our senses, such souls and such bodies with infinite riches in the image of God to be enjoyed, with God, which God of his mercy having freely prepared, they are most happy that so live in the enjoyment of those as to need no accidental thing, no splendors, pomps, and vanities. Socrates, perhaps, being an heathen, knew not that all things proceeded from God to man, and by man returned to God. But we know it must need all things as God doth, that we may receive them with joy and live in his image, as pictures are made curious by lights and shades, which without shades could not be, so is felicity composed of wants and supplies, without which mixture there could be no felicity. And I say this is original. This is a very daring kind of challenge to the Socratic idea, at least as expressed in this kind of passage from Diogenes Laertius, right? Um, they are that it's not actually that the gods are perfect because they don't need anything. Um, it's rather that God, who is alive, right, is full at all times of infinite want and infinite satisfaction because everything that he wants, he brings to pass, right? And that's what creation in some sense is, right? He's, he made us for himself, right? Um, 
to, and his, his total desire for us, his jealousy over us and over our souls, right, is one of the things that Traherne describes himself as realizing in his vision that changes his whole way of looking at things, right? To see God uh, wanting you so entirely is in itself, in some sense, to have the satisfaction of that want that is insatiable in you. Deep cries out to deep, right? That's what that means. Were there no needs, wants would be wanting themselves and supplies superfluous but want being the parent of celestial treasure. It is very strange. Want itself is a treasure in heaven, and so great and one that without it there could be no treasure. God did infinitely for us when he made us to want like gods, that like gods we might be satisfied. The heathen deities wanted nothing and were therefore unhappy, for they had no being. But the Lord God of Israel, the living and true God, was from all eternity and from all eternity wanted like a god. He wanted the communication of his divine essence and persons to enjoy it. He wanted worlds. He wanted spectators. He wanted joys. He wanted treasures. He wanted, yet he wanted not, for he had them. There's an example of something you could only write in English because to want and to want, right? He wanted things, but he did not lack them, right? Um, and so that's kind of the the thought of Traherne's that I will leave you with, um, that in, in some sense, right, your, your desires are the greatest gift of God, because without them, you could never be delighted, right? You could never delight if you didn't have things that you want. Now, I know it's very painful. It's more painful to want things than to do the sort of stoic uh, renunciation of desire, the Buddhist renunciation of, of desire, right? It, that that the, One of the things that's very attractive about that posture is that it isn't painful the way that wanting is, because we on earth who are in sin um, want things and don't have them or don't do them, right? Um, that can be a source of great anguish. What Traherne is saying is if you give that up, you've destroyed even your capacity for joy, right? Because the Christian answer is not to want less, but to want more and to want the right thing. Um, this is a very beautiful way, I think, of, of performing metanoia, of understanding the world as the satisfaction of God's wants, and therefore yourself as the satisfaction of God's wants, right? Um, and, and when you understand it that way, then uh, you're able not only to take delight in God, but in all the things of the world, which now appear to you as the object of God's desire and therefore the satisfaction of his great love, right? You are the satisfaction of his great love. There is, it is good that you should be so. It is good that you should be around, that you should exist, and you exist for no other reason than God wants you around. Um, I'm going to finish just in closing by reading the rest of Matthew 6. Um, I'm not going to sort of expound upon it as I've been doing throughout, because I think at this point you kind of hopefully understand the set of theses that I'm trying to convey. And I hope that you will take this away and then read a lot more gospel passages, uh, a lot more Bible passages in a way that kind of opens them up this way. Um, so here's the rest of Matthew 6. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, right? You, it's a 180 flip, give all for all, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What God has given you, right, is the flowers of the field, right? Is this, is in itself a clothing of reality in beauty, which is for you, which wouldn't be, would have to be pointless unless your mind were there to perceive it. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you do not enjoy the little, how will you delight in the, in the lot, right? You won't even have the things that you enjoy unless you delight in God, right? In some sense, you won't be able to enjoy them because you'll always want more. That was Traherne's point, right? If you make them the direct object of your desires, then you will simply be insatiable. But if you make God the direct object and immediate satisfaction of your desires, then you will have all these other things, right? All these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. 
sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And that's the end of the passage. So I, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I really think that this book, uh, lives up to its name, this turn. Um, I hope you'll go away and check it out. And, uh, and I hope that it will help you as it has indeed helped me to uncover and unpack some of the joy that the scriptures have to offer. All right, let's do the mailbag. Mailbag questions come to me on locals, youngheretics.com forward slash locals, where you can join our community and become a VIP. Uh, locals VIPs get all sorts of extra goodies, such as episodes a week in advance. You get uh, access to the Romans commentary and translation that I'm currently writing chapter by chapter. And, uh, you know, I post a bunch of other stuff like book reviews and so forth. But really what it is, is just a chance to talk about this stuff more, right? Uh, there's so much more to say than I can ever get out in an hour per week. Um, and we talk especially about how to apply these ideas to our lives. Um, I do a weekly live stream Q&A where people ask me these questions. We sort of chat over drinks. And uh, we have, of course, uh, the mailbag. And so here's Tyler in the mailbag. I've been skeptical of dieting methods. Oh, by the way, I should say that uh, we've been taking some pretty heavy questions lately. So I picked one this time around um, as we come to the end of this. There are, it's a little bit more lifestyle stuff, and you will uh, find these also uh, answered and asked on Locals. I've been skeptical of dieting methods for a while now. My red pill moment was when eggs were good, then bad, then good again. Yeah, me too. Uh, people have been eating for all of history, but diets as we know them have been around for maybe 50 years since the abundance of food and choices we have. It seems like studies on diets are either inconclusive or a grift, like Jenny Craig. What are your thoughts on diets? Also, apparently the next step to get us to eat the bugs is to start breaking down what proteins to eat. Make sure you get your dose of chicken, beef, turkey, and bugs. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is, I say this was a light question, but it's actually important, you know, like if we're going to talk about embodiment and we're going to talk about um, the union of body and soul, um, then you know that I care about fitness and I care about it as more than just a way to look good. Although I think that that's part of it, right? Um, if, paying attention to the functioning of your body is expressing in outward form a certain kind of concern for your soul and every bodily action that comes with a sort of spiritual meaning, right? Um, and, and so it, it, this is why don't eat the bugs is such an important slogan. It's not because bugs might not, not be nutritionally valid, so to speak. Uh, hashtag you are nutritionally valid. Um, it's, it's that bugs are gross, right? It's disgusting to eat bugs. Um, and so that visceral reaction, which expresses that food has more than just a nutritional content, has an aesthetic character to it, has a cultural character to it, right? Um, that's why we object to the calls to eat bugs. It's because they come from this logic about food, which is itself anti-human and dehumanizing, right? That treats food as kind of a collection of molecules that will have a collection of effects upon you. And if you could intravenously inject the perfect, you know, number of proteins into your body, um, then you should because it will, you know, maximize your work capacity. I mean, this is why I object to stuff like, you know, the these shakes that are supposed to just, you know, download all of your food for the day into your body. Like that's not what we are. We're not just bodies. We're body, we're embodied souls. Um, and so don't eat the bugs is precisely an expression in popular culture of that idea. And I think that a lot of diets function according to the same logic as the bugs, even if they come from a very different political camp, right? Even if it's like, oh, well, you're, you know, adrenoceno, cortisol, whatever, I'm making up a chemical here, right? It, but there's always coming up with some new ones, right? Your adrenal glands are going to be stimulated by this uh, by, by this food, or you're going to, you know, raise your pH or whatever. Um, and again, it's not that those things aren't true. It's that they talk about food in a really, um, I think unhelpful way, even for looking your best. Um, I was recently in Europe and that experience reminded me something that I've seen before, which is, you know, I, I ate so much in Europe. Uh, I just like devoured everything in sight. And yet, I actually, my like, quote unquote, physique, F-I-Z-E-E-K, started to look better. I started to feel better. Um, and I think that's because, you know, there there's more to your food than just its, you know, macros, just the kind of top line about its nutritional content. All of that having been said, right, I think that a lot of diets fail or become grift because they have to do with hacking your body. And your body is not actually something to be hacked. Your body is something more than that. Um, and so, you know, I have a few baseline rules about, you know, how to eat the way that, you know, is going to make you feel best, like, you know, calories in, calories out, uh, which do kind of have a material nature to it. So, you know, you should, you should eat uh, a good, decent, healthy dose of protein. If you want to get big, you should have, you know, uh, enough carbs to stay running. You should have all of that stuff. But, but more than that, right, you should be um, 
making of your meals, right? A, a, a holistic kind of, you should be seeking like healthy ingredients that are going to make you feel good. And I know that that sounds really basic, but it's actually uh, the opposite of a lot of these diet extremes. Now, having said that, I'm going to give you bits the way that I, I mean, I, I do intermittent fasting because it feels, again, it feels good, right? The, the, there's no substitute for vibes when you have this kind of conversation. I don't think that intermittent fasting is the only way to eat healthily, but I do think that it is a, um, you know, we, we think of it as unnatural, but it's not, it's really kind of a, a sort of a, a normal way for, a, you know, a lot of history to eat, to kind of, um, save your calories for a later time and just, you know, delight in them, uh, at later in the day. Um, and that enables me to kind of keep a, a little bit more control on my, uh, appetites, which as we learned from turn are insatiable. So I love food. I eat a ton of food, especially like meat, uh, and, and proteins, uh, and I am a weightlifter, so I need them. Right. So, uh, you know, I'll eat like, uh, the kind of rule of thumb is one gram of protein per pound of desired the body weight, right? So if you want to weigh 200 pounds, you should be eating, trying to chug, you know, 200 grams of protein. And that's a lot, you know, um, you should, you should probably be, uh, you know, if you're trying to get big, you should be eating a lot of, a lot of protein. Um, and then the rest you can take up with just whatever you like, but you should be paying attention. You should be trying to incorporate into your diet uh, an attention to the food as a, you know, aesthetic object, as a spiritual, uh, you know, practice, which, you know, Christ treats it as, um, and you, you should resist if at all possible, breaking down your, uh, ideas about food into a kind of game of, of hacking, uh, one molecule by way of another molecule. All right. Um, I hope that helps. And, uh, I'll, uh, as always, I'll give more fitness tips on locals because that's one of the things we talk about. Youngheretics.com forward slash locals. Check out my book, How to Save the West, um, and check out the Claremont Institute where I work. We put out the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind, both available online. CRB also available in dead tree form. Um, and you can donate to support us at claremont.org slash donate. Uh, that's it for me this week. It's always a pleasure to be with you and I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. 